Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is going to be our second uh, town hall in the Pierce County region. Uh, and you might notice that this is a little bit different than the one that we did previously, if you guys had joined. Uh, we're doing this in a Zoom webinar format as opposed to the Zoom meeting format. Um, so at the end, there will be a survey. And if you could kind of indicate which one you prefer, that'd be greatly helpful for us. Um, and so if you guys want to participate, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. Um, on the left hand side, you'll see a chat function. Uh, when you're using this, this is primarily to talk with other people that are in the room and just kind of talk with other people that are around. Um, but in the middle, you'll also see a Q&A button. This is going to be how is the best way to get any questions that you have submitted so that we can have them addressed. Uh, and then on the right, you should have the raise hand button. Uh, and this will be if you want to be asking your questions verbally when appropriate. Um, so on here today, we're going to have uh, Tamara Farrell, who is going to be in the background, who is your uh, territory manager for Pierce County. Uh, we have Samantha Lauterbach, who is going to be our state government affairs representative. We have Josh B Joe Bushnell, who's going to be our local GA representative and is also going to give us some info on any federal news coming down the pipeline. And as you may or may not know him, we have Anthony Antone here to help us out. Um, so, Anthony, I guess I'm just going to pass it off to you right here. Great. Um, well, wel welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for the new format. Um, I know we had just around 75 people RSVP. Um, last time, we actually ended up uh, exceeding our 100 cap, which is why we had to switch formats. Um, and so uh, we wanted to make sure that everyone could get in that wanted to get in um, and go from there. So we mean these to be engaging uh, and informative, and we know this is an un- Precedented time in your business and trying to survive and trying to go through what we have what we can do to survive um, We're really lucky with us to, to have dr. Chen with us today um, So I want to make my update on the industry quick um, So we can have lots of time for questions uh, at the end and, and dr. Chen. Thanks for joining us. I'm gonna do a quick update on the industry um, And let's see there we go uh, Can everyone see my screen really quick? All right, uh, the state of the uh, state of the industry. Uh, you saw this slide last month. I just I just want to reiterate. This is an unprecedented time. At the low point so far, the virus we lost 152,000 jobs in hospitality, about 43% of all our employment. You can see by by comparison at the low points where all the other industries fit. And I'm not trying to downplay the loss of their jobs. Um, but this has really hit hospitality brutally hard. Um, and 35% uh, of all job losses in the state have actually just been in, in, in the hospitality industry. Um, Pierce County alone uh, lost 50% uh, of its employment from the high to the low uh, in, in hospitality. Uh, we're still down over 30% uh, this year. I actually checked this morning. I was hoping right before I came on the call that they had posted the July updates, but they weren't quite ready. Uh, but we're still then down uh, 10,000 workers in, in Pierce County alone that are unemployed because of, of COVID and the regulations around COVID um, and are, are struggling to pay rent and move forward. So a lot of our team members were thinking about and, and, and all trying hard to get them back for another day. Um, State rev, uh, rev par for those who don't follow hotels, that's the main measurement for a hotel. It's a combination of revenue coming in per room, uh, occupancy and other things. Um, and even though we're past the low point, uh, rev par for hotels uh, is still down 35%. Statewide, it's 54%. So we talk a lot about restaurants and, and rightfully so, but our lodging members are hurting just as badly in, in a bad time. Can you go back one, Matt? Um, one thing I do want to point out, Quick service is not being impacted like full service in hotels, um, and it's about a third of the industry. So if you're in full service or lodging, these numbers are compounded even worse because these employment numbers are just hospitality, um, which is why I think so many people are, are hurting right now. Go ahead and flip to the next one. I want to do our quick view of the virus. I know uh, Dr. Chen will probably give us an even better one, uh, but just to get everyone to speed each month. Uh, this is the curve. Uh, this is the number of cases uh, per 100,000 in the last 14 days. Um, and uh, this is posted every day on uh, DOH's website. We just map it out so we can see what the curve is doing. Last time I talked to you, I was really afraid. Um, the curve was going up. 
Um, and if we didn't get it to come back down, I was very uh, fearful we were going to have to close again. And I know Dr. Chan has talked about that a couple of times publicly. We all have to rally to wear masks to do things to get the virus to come down. And the good news is, is the virus is coming down. Uh, you can see Pierce County has now gotten under 100 cases uh, per 100,000 in the last 14 days, and that's good news. Still a long way to hit our goal of 25. And so I don't want anyone lightening up just because we're going the right direction. We've got a long way still to go. Next slide, please. Uh, and a quick update on the crystal ball for those of you who are joining this week that missed last time. Uh, the enemy here is the virus. We all need to unite to, to, to defeat the spike and to get ourselves back down to 25. Um, that is our goal. Um, and so to the degree that we can train our employees, over clean, follow the regulations, get our employees to wear masks, remind the public how important it is that if they want to do what we need to, to get us open and save our restaurants and save our hotels, um, help us defeat this virus. Um, I also am trying to tell people that before the governor did a little bit of a rollback last time, um, phase three before the last rollback is probably the best we can hope for, for until spring. So if your business is not going to survive in, in phase three style regulations, um, I think you really need to think about how you remodel your business model or make the, the brutal decisions. And I hate giving people that advice, but I want you to, I want you to be able to move forward the best you can. A question I get asked by the media all the time is, well, how many restaurants are going to close? And the answer is, I don't know. Is there going to be another round of COVID? Is, is how fast is this virus going to come down? How long are we going to be in phase two, which is more detrimental versus getting to phase three? Um, but I did realize I am putting together my budget for next year, this month. And I can be honest in telling you what I'm budgeting for. And that's a loss of 35% of full service restaurants. Um, and so uh, that, is, that is a lot of business for, for legislators who might be on the phone or others. Each time a restaurant closes, that's a loss of about 160000 dollars in taxes. Um, so if we lost 35% of states restaurants, that's close to $600 million in taxes that we're not having to support our community beyond the job losses and beyond the other impact. Uh, state to state travel is, is down for a minimum of two years. Um, so our focus needs to be how do we get the road trip going when the road trip is safe to do? Um, and how do we unite ourselves around seeing all the Washington has to offer? We can have 52 three-day weekends here in Washington, whether you're uh, at the visiting Ruston Way in near Tacoma, or you're getting up into the rainforest and taking a hike, or getting out to wine country, or down to see a, a Mount St. Helens in the volcano. Um, we can have a great set of vacations here in Washington, and if we do, when it's safe to do so, uh, save a lot of hospitality jobs, and that is one of our focuses. Next uh, slide, please. My, my last plea is um, let's drive for 25. Um, this is a campaign we're doing with AWB and with other business groups uh, to remind people um, where in a mass saves a job, where in a mass saves a small business um, and, and, and comply. I would ask, and Matt, if you can type the, the quick link into the chat room, um, if you can grab that or go to your social media and do a search for Washington Hospitality Association, you can grab these frames, take a picture of, your, of yourself in a mask, you're all community leaders by the nature of opening a business. Um, and uh, let's keep the pedal down on being safe and encouraging good behavior. Let's strive for that number to get to a point where we can get to a good place. I know you may have a lot of questions for me, uh, but I think from a time frame, let's save them all for the end. And then Dr. Chen and, and Sam and Joe, we can answer questions at the end together. So uh, with that, uh, I want to move on to the next stage of our agenda, and Sam, I believe you're going to kind of give us an update on what's going on with state regulations, and since like, we met last month in Pierce County, um, yeah. what do we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. So I uh, think since the last time this group met, there were some changes in rollbacks like Anthony alluded to in his graph. Uh, so on July 24th, as the numbers continued to rise, Governor Inslee uh, rolled back guidance for restaurants and taverns for our industry. Those rollbacks include alcohol service. Now alcohol service has to end at 10 p.m. until phase four. Vending and other games uh, like pool and darts is prohibited until phase four. Um, in phase three, uh, if you remember, those table sizes were going to be able to be 10. Now they're uh, rolled back to five. 
Um, and the, your occupancy has to be 50% or less like in phase two. In phase three, um, oh, in bar, uh, bar style seating is now prohibited um, in all phases, but they did clarify other types of counter seating. Um, so for instance, if you have a, a, a bar style um, pushed up against a window, that's okay, but bar style seating bellied up to the bar is still prohibited. Indoor service, at, this is a big one. So indoor service at taverns, breweries, wineries, and distilleries is prohibited until phase four, um, unless certain food service is provided. So this has impacted those uh, tavern licenses and breweries and wineries who have that specific type of endorsement through the LCB. So your team here has been working with the LCB and DOH to get some approved food. So you can, uh, you know, remodel your business like Anthony alluded to earlier. So you can provide more foods um, while maintaining all of the permits and uh, and compliance that you need to be in. And the last that I just wanted to bring up, which was a big one as well, any indoor dining is prohibited uh, to guests that are not from the same household. So when uh, folks come in, one thing that we're just recommending is checking in with them and saying, hey, uh, due to the new government, our governor's uh, guidelines, we need to ensure that you guys are all from the same household. If that's not an option or if that's not accurate, can we provide you with a different alternative like to go food or we have outdoor seating? So just wanted to highlight those big changes for everyone this morning. Sam, thank you very much. I know we'll probably have uh, more questions uh, at, the, uh, at the end for you. So if you can hang around for a little bit, um, but Matt, the, we did make posters to make communicating to our guests about the single household uh, easier. If you get a chance to find that and also post that uh, from our coronavirus hub, um, where a lot of, we're providing a lot of resources to, uh, to the operators. Um, so if you get a chance to do your own and go around the coronavirus hub, I think you'll find a lot of different posters, regulation guidelines, Q and A's to be able to help you out. Joe, can you give us a local and federal update of, uh, of what people need to know since we last talked to Pierce County last month? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Joe Wishnell. I'm the local government affairs person for Pierce County. Uh, first off, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, some of the things going on federally. Uh, as many of you might be aware, uh, the Senate went to Reese, and it's not expected that um, they will be coming back until sometime after Labor Day. Uh, the House did come in for an emergency session, uh, but their focus has mostly been on the United States Postal Service and uh, the crisis that they uh, see there. Um, some other updates I would like to give is that um, there's some it, there's an impasse uh, in talks with the, the the House Democrats and the Senate Republicans. The Senate Republicans would like a, a narrow, skinny bill, uh, as they would call it, that's a $1 trillion package. And the House uh, is looking for a $3 trillion package. So that's about a $2 trillion swing that they need to come to a compromise on. But the, the big challenge is a lot of the, uh, up to about 50% of the Senate Republicans believe that $1 trillion is too much. Um, and so, as you can see, that there isn't even an agreement within those in the, um, on one side of the aisle. Uh, so right now, it, it, uh, the, uh, excuse me, the Senate uh, Republicans uh, would love to see it, the um, unemployment uh, number, uh, a dollar number go down to $300 a week and another round of PPP funding and liability protections. Um, and then the Senate, uh, the House, uh, Democrats would love to see it uh, go to uh, continue at the $600 unemployment rate uh, through the rest of the year. Um, as you might be aware of, the president on August 8th issued some executive orders. Um, whether those, the legality behind those is dubious at the moment, but uh, no one has challenged it so far. And it's two, of the, two of the major things that they, it does is defers employees portion of federal payroll taxes and uh, extends the unemployment insurance benefits to the end of the year at $400 a week and requiring the state to pay, the states to pay 25%. Uh, many states have pushed back on that 25% because their budgets are already slashed due to COVID and many uh, do not believe they can afford that 25% uh, that the president is asking for. 
Uh, locally, I wanted to point out a, a major uh, program that the Pierce County Council passed. Uh, with the help uh, and leadership of uh, Council Member Marty Campbell, uh, the, economic, uh, the Economic Development Department um, is administrating a new program for commercial and rental assistance. And it's not just a loan, it is a, a grant for three months. And I'm gonna share my screen real quick so I can show you the, the website. Uh, so let me know if uh, you all see that. Share, there it is. There we go. Okay, uh, so if you go to the Pierce County Economic Development website, you will see here Pierce County rent, uh, commercial rent and mortgage payment assistance and subject to funds uh, that are available. So it's a first come first serve. So make sure that you get in there and, and get it as quick as possible. Um, eligible businesses may receive up to three months of commercial and rent mortgage assistance, not to exceed $5,000. And it, it is a grant and it uh, is to assist our struggling businesses, especially those that have not been able to open uh, since March or those that had, can sh demonstrate like a 25% reduction in revenue. Um, so make sure to get that in. Um, I think, you know, I'm going to wrap it up there, but uh, I really appreciate, you know, everyone that uh, has been working on the behalf of our industry. And uh, yeah, so have a great day. Thank you, Joe. Can you paste the link to that website in the chat room? I will. Thank you very much. Um, so with that, I, I, Doc, uh, we're, we're blessed today uh, to have Dr. Chen, and I want to introduce him in a second, but I, I want to say thanks again to the Tacoma Pierce County Chamber, uh, the Puyallup Sumner Chamber of Commerce, uh, Visit Tacoma. Um, I think, one, I would have rather not gone through this uh, epidemic at all, uh, but if there's anything as positive as come is how we've all come together as one to try to help our communities move forward. And so their partnership through this and getting the word out, um, I, I love how we've just all dropped all preconceptions and barriers and said, hey, let's help hospitality survive and save as many restaurants and hotels as we can. Um, and so thanks again to their partnership on today and throughout the, the ep epidemic and what we've been sharing, doing, uh, getting the word out there about mask wearing and others. Uh, they've all three been just great partners. And so thank you. With that, um, I want to invite Dr. Anthony Chen, the uh, director of uh, the Pierce County Health Department. Um, and uh, Dr. Chen, I'm sure uh, when they said, hey, we've got a job for you, you never imagined being in, in this position uh, when we got rolling. And so uh, we've all been thinking about you and the challenges you've had. We're looking forward to your presentation and we'll have some questions for you uh, after you, you go from there. So, so welcome. Great, thank you, and uh, you know I appreciate the invitation to be with you today. Um, you are just great partners, um, not just during COVID-19, but at all times. You're such an important strategy for us to make sure there, there are not foodborne outbreaks or other infectious outbreaks in the community, um, and very much want to appreciate that. Uh, you know, make, make sure you understand I appreciate that. So um, I'm just going to quickly touch on what's going on in terms of cases here um, in Pierce County. As you know, um, back in the spring, you know, in April, we hit a peak of about 77 cases a day. And then the governor um, implemented the stay home, stay safe order, which, um, you know, was very difficult for everyone. Um, I know it severely impacted businesses that were not designated as essential. Um, but it changed every one of our lives, right? I mean, people were doing, um, trying the best they could, um, and it worked. We brought the cases down. Uh, it, it took much longer than we had hoped. I mean, we were sitting on this plateau about 10, 50, I'm sorry, about 20, 35 cases a day for about a month, and then we kind of got it down to another plateau, about 10, 15 cases a day. Um, and then at the very end of May, beginning of June, um, we were able to go to phase two. And then what happened after that was just shocking to us. You know, in less than two weeks, our cases just started skyrocketing. 
Um, and if you remember, I said um, in April, our peak was 77. I mean, we went over like 120 um, at our most recent peak. It, it, it was just so fast and so high. And I think what happened was, you know, everyone was, you know, had done really well. They were, they were cooped up. They were frustrated, you know, from staying at home. And they forgot we were just going from phase one to two. And they thought everything was back to normal. Oh, and by the way, the weather is beautiful, right? And, um, you know, it, it was just gorgeous weather. And everyone decided to go, go out. And, and what we saw was um, within this rapid uptick, was this the point of this sphere was being led by the young people, especially the 20 year olds. So at one point, our new cases, about a quarter were 20 year olds. And um, at that point, about 40% of our cases were under 50. Um, now I mentioned point of the sphere because we had seen in other states like Florida and other places that have really melted down that the 20 year olds might start this, but then they spread it to the people older and the people younger, right? So if you remember, I said it was about 25% of our cases were in the 20 year olds. Um, that has now dropped. It's about a fifth of our cases in the 20 year olds. And it, it was that about um, half of our cases um, were under 50. Now it is two thirds. Okay, so what, what that means is the 20 year olds have spread it to 30 year olds, 40 year olds, they actually have spread it. We're, we're seeing an uptick also in, in some of the older age groups like the 70 year olds. Um, and I'm sure your members saw this, right? I mean, when the cases got so high, they started getting into businesses. And, um, and our nursing homes, which had the situation very well controlled for a few months there, they started seeing big outbreaks again. Um, I mean, we were seeing it everywhere, you know, businesses of any kind. I mean, even the so-called essential businesses, right? Hardware stores. We did not see cases in hardware stores in the spring. Well, we're seeing them now, right? Um, I think you may be aware on our website, we have started posting what sectors of business um, have had the, you know, we're, tr we, we're trying not to identify individual businesses because we know this could have severe impact on their business, but we're, um, the public wants to know. So we are now reporting like what sectors are in there. But if you look at it, it's, it's all sectors, um, you know, beauty shops, right? Nail salons, coffee shops, restaurants, hardware stores, um, logistics companies, where big warehouses, it's everywhere. Um, and so that has been a real challenge for us. Um, we're now luckily starting to get it under control. Um, we are turning the, uh, we've reached the peak. And just to give you an idea, um, one of the metrics the state uses, which is the total number of cases we've had in the last 14 days, and we express that as a case rate, so per 100,000 population. When we went to phase two in early April, that number was 16. The state's target was 25, right? To move between phases, their target is 25 per 100,000. Well, we got to a peak of 149, you know, um, and we are now right around 100, like 103. And so, um, yeah, there, there's one of the versions of the graph, right? And, you know, um, I, I think there are several things that helped. I think certainly the um, the efforts by your your association as well as AWB and you know that the big media campaign that was just talked about that was very helpful um, I think people were starting to realize that they had to scale back and buckle down and you know get back to limiting their travel you know making sure they're wearing the face mask and we believe the the face covering face mask mandate really made a difference. We saw that in other parts of the state like Yakima, which um, you, you may be aware was like the highest rate in the whole West Coast for a while. They, they started turning down before the rest of the state because they were one of the counties that the governor had implemented the, you know, no mass, no service policy before he rolled it out statewide. And the whole community really embraced the need um, because they were hit so hard. And, you know, there was a point where, uh, ironically, they were the only county going down in cases while every other county in the state was going up. 
So, um, you know, we still have a ways to go. I mean, you also may, may be aware now there's a lot of talk about school, right? Any of, the, any of you who have children, right? I mean, you're, you're sweating this because we're getting close to the start of school. Um, and you may be aware, of, I've told the schools because of the planning time frame they need to be in, that I didn't think it was safe to reopen for school. Um, I, I kind of made that announcement in, um, in July because that's the time frame they need to plan, at, uh, plan in. So certainly at that point, we had not even reached our peak yet. And we, we didn't know where that peak was going to be. Uh, it has turned down. Um, the, uh, as I mentioned um, yesterday, we uh, reported 103 per 100,000. Uh, the next um, marker we're looking at is um, according to the Department of Health is 75 per 100,000 for schools. At that point, they can consider start bringing back kids for um, in-person education for elementary schools, right? So right now the schools can um, are going to be starting remote. Um, they can bring back small groups of the highest risk learners, right? But these are, you know, um, just a lot, it's really upended everyone's lives um, and, you know, it's, we're working and, and, you know, the health department's working on it, but it's really you and everyone else in the community that's making the difference, right? I mean, it's everyone wearing their masks, you know, thinking about, do they really need to go out and, and do that thing or do that travel, staying close to home, you know, standing, um, you know, separated from people. Um, so, of course, we want to control this community transmission because, um, you know, I appreciate what um, Anthony said, because the enemy is the virus, right? If we want to reopen businesses and reopen the community, we've got to control the virus. If we want to reopen schools and have kids back in in-person education, we've got to control the virus, right? If, if we want to be able to go back you know, like to taking summer vacations and traveling the way that we used to, we've got to control the virus. So, um, yeah, one of the other things too, just to, to let you know in terms of our work in helping to control the virus is we've, we've greatly expanded testing capacity. So, um, yeah, so certainly for um, you and your employees, um, if, uh, there, there are just several guidelines, right? Obviously, if people have symptoms, they should go get tested. But then also, you know, if people have been, for example, you know, you know, for a while, there were a lot of demonstrations, right? So if people have gone to demonstrations and they weren't able to physically distance and, and people around them weren't wearing face masks and so on, they may want to get tested about five days after that. Um, certainly, if people think they've been around people who, who um, you know, maybe they're at some social gathering, um, they need to think about getting tested. Um, but, you know, just a lot of different things going on. Um, again, so much appreciate the work that you do. And, and by the way, Anthony, I really appreciate that op-ed you wrote um, a few months ago, you know, reminding us about how important this sector is. Um, I know that before we were able to move to phase two, um, and, and actually before the governor really laid out his plan on how we were going to move, I know we had some conversations about who should we open. And, you know, one of the things that we're very concerned about is the equity piece. And, and I, I really appreciate you pointing out that not only does your sector employ a lot of people, there are a lot of, I mean, these are a lot of um, entry level, lower wage jobs. These are the people who have the least margin of error. Right, and there are also a lot of um, immigrant, minority, and women business owners in the uh, restaurant industry. Um, I, I at one time when I was still practicing, by the way, I, I was um, I worked up in an international district in um, Seattle, and I knew just about every dim sum waitress because a lot of them, when they came over, would would get pregnant, and you know, at some point, I would have like seen them during their pregnancy or delivered their baby. Um, so, uh, you know, very familiar with how important um, that industry is and, and also took care of a lot of the immigrants who cleaned rooms and hotels, right? I mean, they have just become such a important workforce and it, it was very important for us as the health department to make sure that we weren't just opening up the high paying jobs, but we also were opening up the jobs that a lot of people were working in. And, and I know the last recession, right? I mean, 
while many sectors were losing jobs, a lot of people were able to move into the hospitality association and at least you know, get some jobs that maybe didn't pay as well as they did before, but still kept the paycheck going in. So very much appreciate um, your um, editorial, uh, your op-ed, and reminding people how important your sector is. Thank um, you. So, so anyway, um, I think that's, if you let me go, I'll, I'll ramble on forever, so. <laughs> well, uh, I believe you have a guest with you too, but before I start asking you questions, Dr. Chen, that have come through, I've got everything from text to email to some Q and A's and all, uh, but do you want to introduce your guest that you have with you uh, today? Yeah, I think Amber should be on. Amber, are you on? I am on. I am just just here for any additional information that might be needed about specifically um, food and all the related business around that. Well, well, welcome, Amber. What's your role with the Pierce County Health Department? Um, I am an environmental health specialist. So um, right now, at home, um, handling everything from here, but generally would be out in the field doing inspections um, in the facilities. Well, and welcome. Amber, Amber, am I correct? You used to do a lot of training, right? Um, and onboarding of our staff, is that right? Are you yes. still doing that? That is so, correct. <laughs> And that's really important because for restaurants, they don't want one inspector come in one day and, and tell them something, another inspector come in another day and tell them something. So we are very proud of how consistent and well-trained our inspectors are. And you know, you're looking at one of the people who's responsible for doing that. So I just want to call that out. Yes, uh, so I'm the health department lead for our association. And I will say we have many complaints about different counties and the inconsistencies, but Pierce County is one of those that we uh, hear great things about. So we really appreciate it as well. Uh, it's very, very good to hear. <laughs> well, let, let me get to some of the questions if that's okay, Dr. Chen. Uh, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. I will tell you uh, a couple things. One, um, uh, thanks for your comments on our ownership. We're really proud of the diversity in our industry. Um, we actually have some of the highest um, women-owned percentage of businesses of any industry. In fact, between women-owned or co-owned, over 50% of restaurants and hotels are over 50%, one of the very few industries to hit that target. So we're proud of that and a lot of the opportunities we provide. Um, uh, and, and also, for those of you who don't know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Pierce County guy. If that, if that was actually a window you were looking at, uh, my house is somewhere behind you there, Dr. Chen. I, I'd be looking at the back of your head with, uh, from a long ways away. My son just graduated from the stadium, and uh, I'm a Sumner High School graduate as well. So uh, lifetime Pierce County person, uh, so it's good to be here today. Dr. Chen, let me get to some of the core of, the, of uh, questions our members have. Uh, we live on, on tiny margins. We're trained for food safety. You know, each month we are closed. Um, it takes us another four or five months just to pay off the debt that happened when we were closed. And, and, and these challenges are unprecedented. And, and so members are feeling a little frustrated about why do restaurants and hotels feel picked on? And I don't know, you're not picking on them, but I think from the health perspective, I think you can help people kind of understand why some, some of the health field have focused on the industry for some of the regulations and why we're a key part of bringing this virus back down. Yeah, so I think I can understand the frustration. I mean, I, you know, I, as I said, it, 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 in my past lives, I, I've known a lot of people who, who've run, um, you know, restaurants and worked in the hospi hospitality industry, and especially restaurants have very thin margins, right? I mean, all those chefs on TV look glamorous, but, you know, that's not reality. And, and actually, how many of those chefs have shut their restaurants over time or, or gone bankrupt or... You know, um, so I mean, it, it's it's hard work and it's thin margins. And um, at, at the same time, if you see the role that restaurants play in our society, they're a really key pl um, venue for socialization, right? So they 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 play a significant role. On the other hand, the the fact that they are sites of socialization means that a lot of people come through them, and, and so. 
you know, this virus is really telling us that when people gather, you can spread it, right? I, I mean, it's no different than the flu or the cold or, or norovirus for that matter, right? I mean, when, when um, it has a chance to jump onto someone else and it, it can spread it, the viruses love that, right? I mean, that's how they operate. Um, and so, you, you know, I think part of the challenge, um, I'm sure that you and your government relations folks know, is that there are all these different sectors that are competing um, in front of governor, right? So construction got the green light before other people did. Um, you know, um, I, I'm, you know, I mentioned about the schools and people are complaining like, well, why aren't you letting schools reopen, but child cares are, re are open? Well, you know, child cares were designated as essential services because people need to work. And, and you know, professional sports got to carve out, uh, churches and faith organizations got to carve out, right? So, you know, I, I understand it's, it's very frustrating when people see some other sector got to carve out and they didn't get a carve out. But the bottom line here is we're trying to really limit the spread of this virus. I mean, there is no immunity to this essentially, right? I mean, like last year, you might remember, we had a measles outbreak down in Clark County, and we were able to contain that within a few months. Why? Well, because like over 90% of kids are vaccinated. I know I had measles when I was growing up, um, you know, and many parents either had measles if they're older like me or you know, they got vaccinated, right? So there might be a little outbreak, especially in, in communities where there's low immunization rates, but once we could, um, kind of throw a circle around that and control that and get people vaccinated, we can control the outbreak. Right now, I mean, if, if you think of, uh, I mean, we've had a total of 6,000, a little over 6,000 cases. And, and we've got what, 900,000 people in the county? I mean, that's a tiny percentage, right? So there's no immunity. And so we do have to resort to these pretty blunt instruments of controlling movement, you know, trying to reduce the spread. Um, and, and the movement not only, you know, it prevents sick people from spreading it to other people and pr protects you from getting infected by someone who might be sick, right? So. So yeah, I, I know it's very frustrating for your association because it has meant that um, restaurants have been one of the places where they've had, um, they've regulated. Um, obviously, the um, the travel restrictions and, and the the fear that people have now means people aren't staying in hotels, right? Um, so it it's <clears throat> really a big impact. So I, I understand the frustration, but. Um, you know, I really appreciate, as I said, what your association, as well as AWB and the other associations statewide have done to really help get the message out. You don't know how important there is, right? There are only certain people who will listen to me or to the Tacoma Pierce County Health Department, but they might listen to employers, you know, people they know through church, uh, people they, they know through sports or other things. So the more people we have carrying the message that we've got to you know, buckle down and do all these things so that we can get the, the virus, virus level down, the community transmission down is so important, right? I mean, when we saw that big surge, as I said, I mean, there were days we were working with over 20 businesses because they had cases, right? And, and, and that's just purely because the cases were so high. It wasn't like the businesses were doing anything wrong, right? I mean, you, you know, you've all had to implement these plans about the, the sanitation, the gloves, the masks, the, you know, whatever, whatever. And people were doing that. It's just that, you know, the employees don't live at the restaurant or the hotel. They go home. And some of them are doing great uh, in terms of not going out. But who knows? Maybe they did go to the supermarket and, you know, someone there was sick. Uh, maybe they're a young person who went out and hung out with their friends and had a barbecue in the park without wearing masks, right? I mean, when the level's so high in the community, um, it's going to get everywhere. So um, I, I'm just asking for patience from people. We've got to really control this virus. I think we saw that when we moved a little too fast there in June, things actually got worse, right? Yeah. That, so, so uh, well, and, I, I don't and, know if that's any um, solace to you guys. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Chen, for answering the question. It was a tough one to answer. And it, um, it, at the same time, 
I mean, we're really looking forward to working with you because the debt is piling up. How do we balance? And so as, as if you have ideas for us on how to improve and we can help get numbers down, um, it'd be great if all of our bills would stop while we got through this. It'd make it a lot easier, but unfortunately that's, that's not where it goes. I have a, if-, if now, Can if I say able, something? Sorry. Yeah. Can I just say something? Um, you know, the tools we've been able to use are pretty blunt, okay? And I can tell you when those cases were shooting up, I would have loved to have been able to talk to you all and other sectors um, to, to, I mean, this is before the governor finally stepped in, right? But, you know, we were thinking like, hey, if we had to like ramp some things back, what would work, right? I, I mean, you saw that when the governor said, well, you know, all these people have to go to outdoor dining only. I mean, I know not every restaurant does outdoor dining. Okay, so, you know, in some ways it, was, it, it probably worked, but it was a blunt instrument. And I would love to be able to have communication, more direct communications with you guys to be able to say, if there are places where we can do some local adjustments, I want to know what works for you guys, right? So for example, if we, you know, if the governor didn't do this and, and we decide that it would help, because we do know there's more transmission indoors than outdoors, right? But it would have been helpful for us to say, well, what if we went to outdoor dining only? And then you guys could tell us, hey, it doesn't make sense for what X percentage of our members. And who wants to lease or buy tables if we don't know we're going to still be open in three months? And maybe what would help is we ask Pierce County to use CARES funding to buy the tables or lease the tables and turn around and lease it to restaurants for a few months for a buck a month, right? You know, whatever. I mean, these are things that I don't understand your businesses. Um, and we would love to be able to have ongoing communication uh, with your association and other sectors, right? So that if you're- uh, Dr. Chen, I'm, I'm in. I'll, I'll tell you right now, let, let, let's, let's do that within the week. I'll, I'll look forward to having that uh, conversation because as we come down to 25 and we choose to turn a dial again, we want to make sure we're doing the right things, mm -hmm. we're open sharing um, and, and, uh, and how to make this work. And so I'm committed right now, Dr. Chen, let, let's, let's get that conversation scheduled and I'll really look forward to it. To, to that to that talk. That's great. Um, on, can I ask a question on compliance? And I don't know if this is you or Amber, either one, uh, jump in. If there was one thing that you're seeing in Pierce County that our operators could do better or that you most worries you about restaurant non-compliance, what would you want the 50 people on this call and the 200 that will watch it later to walk away with and say, Dr. Chen or Amber asked me to do this. And if I can do this, I'm making a difference. What, what would be the one compliance issue you'd ask it to see that we're not complying enough or that worries you the most. Give, give, us, give us a focus that we can focus on after we uh, hang up today. Hey, Amber, do you want to feel that? Sure. So um, I have not been out in the field for a while now, but um, I do talk to our inspectors every single morning. And for the most part, we have gotten great response from our food establishments. Um, they really are doing really well with 99% with of everything we ask. And most of what we're finding that isn't being done is just due to um, lack of information or um, lack of understanding at where we're at in the rules, especially when they were changing so frequently. It was just difficult to keep up with them. Um, I know that I am on the coronavirus website 24 seven looking things up just so that I'm aware of what's going on and can field questions. But in general, um, as they always say, good hand washing right now, mask use, um, proper mask use is probably I would say number one for everyone right now, but not saying that we're not seeing a lot of it. It's just, um, that's what's gonna help the most. Thank you. Yeah, Anthony, if I can jump in really quick. I yeah. also talked with Pierce County last week and some of the, the more specific things that I think uh, the group should think about is um, 
the contact tracing log, you know, there was some confusion when that first rolled out that uh, we were mandated to have it and then it kind of got gray and we weren't supposed to have it. Um, just for clarification, an operator does need to have some sort of a log to contact trace. However, the information that you get from a customer is voluntary. So you should house one behind the counter with your hostess or one of your frontline staff so you have it available. Um, another thing that we just heard uh, that I heard from Pierce County on top of mask um, complaints and I think most of it is from customers was um, around occupancy. So really ensuring that we are sticking to the 50% occupancy. We know it's really hard to send away guests because um, you know we haven't had them for a long time. So to welcome them all in so we can serve them, but just ensure that you're really implementing wait times and some of those staggered seating times would be really great. Great. Thank you, uh, Amber and, 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 and Sam for, for answering the, the question. I think there's so much to listen to. Sometimes just having a moment to focus. Okay, let me get on better on one thing today can help. Um, I want to get to some of our questions. The last question I wanted to ask you, and then, then I'm going to turn over some of the questions that have come in. And then Dr. Chen and Amber, if you have questions for us as an industry, I'd love for you to ask them back at us as well. Uh, one of the things that our suppliers are starting to warn us about is a glove shortage. Um, and uh, I know many of the health officials across the state said, that, well, actually, we prefer hand washing anyway. Hand washing gloves are not the be all end all because you touch things and you forget to then wash your hands. We're washing your hands is a good campaign. Um, has there been a conversation of if the warning of the glove shortage becomes a glove shortage, um, has there been a conversation in, in, in the health world about moving to hand washing campaigns or how we, we might manage that? You know, I let me check with our emergency operations center about whether they're seeing a glove shortage. I, you know, I've not heard about this, but you know, one of the challenges that we've had is the lack of a national strategy here. Um, as you know, the federal government has kind of decided they're going to push everything down to the states and. So, you know, it's very frustrating for me that, you know, as I mentioned in the spring, everyone really suffered to bring cases down and we bought the country several months of time, but, you know, there's still some issues with the higher grade PPE about availability of that. There's still some issues with some testing supplies and, um, and then as cases have gone higher, you know, really skyrocketed across the country with where you know, been, we were seeing some backlogs and uh, back, back capacity and so on. So I think the challenge has been um, a lack of a, a national plan to ensure that production of important things like, you know, gloves and gowns and masks, and, and, you know, all the other things that are needed for this are there. Uh, and, and then of course, there's all the consumer hysteria, right? I mean, I, I understand people are making a run on toilet paper again. <laughs> Um, but, you know, hand sanitizer, I understand, um, it is uh, problematic, but, you know, I, I think maybe one of the things we can do is elevate with our emergency operation folks and that, um, like for the higher grade PPE, right? I mean, we know who gets prioritized for that. That's the hospitals and the doctors and so on. Um, and even within that setting, I know that there were some issues around um, equity because the big hospitals like Multicare would get prioritized often higher than like small private clinics. Um, and so um, let me check with them about what their supply is uh, for non-surgical, you know, higher grade equipment and whether um, they might have enough supply to be able to support, um, you know, businesses as well. I know Pierce County has put some money into that um, but that's a question that um, I haven't heard recently. So let me make a note of that. Okay. I'm going to bring up the, uh, Amber, did you have anything to add to that before I bring up some of the questions from our members? Yeah, there, um, I know initially there was L&I requirements for glove use uh, just in every sector, not just hospitality. Um, and they have really rolled back on that. So we're just going with regular glove use right now. Like you don't need to be wearing gloves to hand somebody 
a soda. You don't need to be wearing gloves for those things um, that don't require it. So like no bearing contact with ready to eat foods. That's just our general rule. Wash your hands a lot, like you were saying. And uh, we would really hate to have uh, a noro or a hep A outbreak right now as well. So good hand washing, good glove use, but tongs are great. Spoons work really well. Um, utensils, deli tissue, you don't have to use gloves. There are other ways um, to do it. If you guys do have questions, please reach out to us. I'm more than happy to help. Okay. Well, let's keep an open door on that because we, we started to get, there's three or four major restaurant suppliers and they've all started giving us warnings last week. So we just wanted to see what you knew. It sounds like it's something we can work on together. And, and I, I don't know about anyone else, but being from, from Sumner, I always sing the Scalp Fair song when I wash my hands, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when I finish the song, I know my hands are, are, are clean. Um, I would love to help with any processes anybody needs to look at. So. Uh, a couple of questions we have, and this is what I get quite often, is we're really tied to that number of, of, of let's get ourselves down to 25. And you know, when we hear about increased testing or the changes in the way we're calculating, does any of that impact our time frames or, or lessons? And you can see Monica's questions there, but I do get questions about testing rates and how that, that changes numbers. Um, is there a perspective on that that you already take into consideration or is that more of a myth out there that I think takes people off track? Yeah, I think there's um, been a lot of people who try to explain away the increase of cases by claiming it's just due to testing. So what people need to look at is what is the positivity rate, right? So our positivity rate, um, along with this big uptick in cases, even though we were testing more, the positivity rate actually went up. I mean, we, we were sitting around, I think, 2% when we went to phase two, and then we hit like 8%. So what, what's that's, what that's saying is that, yes, indeed, even though we're doing more testing, we're, there are also more cases in the community. Um, we're starting to see that drop back down. I think we're down back down to about five percent. I you know, don't quote me on that one, but I, you know, we, so that is a good sign. As I mentioned, our cases are coming down. This uh, case rate per hundred thousand is coming down, um, and the positivity is coming down. So, so those are all good signs. Um, we still have a ways to go, and, and I think the lesson we learned from June was we didn't get it low enough. Okay, so now I don't think anyone wants to go back to a stay home order, right? I mean, it would just kill everyone, you know, both financially and psychologically. But I think we're finding that if people can truly embrace, um, you know, all these other measures like using masks and, you know, you know, keeping their distance, keeping their group size to less than five, um, you know, all, all those things that we've encouraged people to do. Uh, that we, you know, can help bring it down and um, hopefully get it down lower um, than where we were before. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, the answer isn't less testing. Let's test more. It'll get that positivity rate down and hopefully discover more people that might have it so we can get them quarantined and stop them spreading. So is it, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, one thing I think another uh, question that came up in the chat, um, and, and more of this is just a statement. I think the industry is feeling the pressure seeing October uh, on the horizon. Um, so we need to get the cases back down, um, but we recognize we're gonna lose outdoor dining all together um, come October. So we really are on a, on a little bit of clock for saving businesses and saving jobs to before the weather turns, um, how to manage that. Um, any, uh, any thoughts other than all of us rallying to try to get the numbers down before October? So we have options or, uh, any thoughts on the pressure the industry feels as they live in the Northwest, they know rain and wind are coming and, uh, outdoor dining has got, uh, is some shorter life in front of us. Any thoughts for us on that? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, first of all, be creative, right? I mean, we're already seeing in some municipalities, I mean, you mentioned you're from Sumner, right? I mean, Sumner has allowed some of the restaurants to push out their seating onto the street, right? I, I mean, that now, of course, that doesn't address the weather issue, but I mean, that's just one creative thing where, 
um, you know, the sidewalk often isn't enough to get you volume, you know, even if you threw a few tables out there, right? So, so that's one where, you know, the city was willing to talk about that. So I don't know if there are other options for us to still create some kind of protected outdoor seating, even when the weather gets bad, right? So, but let's, let's have conversations around that. But there is one thing that, you know, you all can really help us with too which is this year, everyone should get the flu vaccine. I don't care whether you got it before, you really should get it this year. The recommendation of flu vaccination is anyone over six months of age who does not have a medical reason not to get it. And why is that so important? Well, you cannot tell the difference between COVID-19 and influenza when you first get sick. Okay, and just give you an idea, back in, I think it was April, we did an event at the Tacoma Dome um, with FEMA. And I mean, pretty high barrier to get in. I mean, it sold out in like three days. And we did it for a week, but it sold out in three days. And you had to have a fever, cough, whatever, you know, be an essential worker, you know, or have a chronic health condition. Only 2% of those tests were positive. 98% of people who had fever, cough, whatever, had flu, rhinovirus, some other kind of virus, okay? Now we don't have vaccines for many of those viruses. We do have a vaccine for the flu. And you know, if you remember what it was like in March, April, and with so many people being sick and everyone panicking, you know, cramming the ERs, uh, we, we, once we start getting into that October timeframe, right? That is flu and upper respiratory season. So. One of the things that will help, and, and same thing will apply for your employees. They're going to show up, fever, sniffles, whatever, you know, cough, whatever, and you're going to have to say, hang on, you go get tested, stay home, whatever, until we know your result. And so if at least some percentage of, of them got the flu vaccine and we know it's not the flu, right, then that's that much less hassle for you. By the way, there's some really encouraging reports out of the southern hemisphere so remember their seasons are flipped from ours their flu season is milder now and we believe it is because all the same precautions people are taking for COVID-19 are helping prevent the spread of the flu right so interesting thought so yeah. in the future we might want everyone to wear masks during the flu season okay however but it's kind of just saying remember it's that flu upper respiratory season we need Everyone take the same precautions, and this year, everyone should get the flu vaccine when it becomes available, just to save hassle, relieve the pressure on the healthcare system, um, and, you know, but again, hopefully, we can try and get those cases down, um, but, you know, the challenge is not only will the weather turn in October, COVID may act like the flu, who knows, right? I mean, it, it may start to get more aggressive in, in the upper respiratory um, uh, season as well. That's why it's so important we get it down as low as possible, get people's habits really ingrained so that they are doing, you know, practicing all those hygiene and, and um, you know, safe, you know, distancing and masking all that. Um, and then we can head into this, um, I mean, we can do it. I mean, it can be done. You look at New Zealand, they had zero domestic cases for 102 days. Astounding. Zero in the whole country. Domestic case. You know, there were some imported cases, right? It can be done. We just weren't able to do it as tightly here. And then I think people kind of rushed out as soon as we, you know, um, loosened things up. Well, and I don't know how anyone else is doing, but I have an 18 year old and I'll tell you, tackling him and making sure he doesn't go out and he behaves, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it is hard. And so I think, I think hopefully we establish these behaviors and, and make it easier on, on them not to spread it. Um, I, I know your time is do valuable, Dr. Chan, and we're coming up on, on an hour. I have one more question for you, Matt, unless any other have come in. I feel like some of the others have been addressed along the way. Um, I think you did a good job a couple of weeks ago of warning people to keep being safe, that we could close if the numbers got too high. Um, how do you feel about the, the direction of the cases? Is that still a warning you have for us? And is there anything that you really would encourage our, our industry um, to do between the next time and hopefully we can talk again? 
that's something I'm really worried about, you know, and, and one of the things that I'm frustrated about is our inability to be really nimble, right? So I, I, I was talking about New Zealand. After, at like 103 days, they got an outbreak and they turned on a dime. They immediately locked down one of their biggest cities, Auckland, right? And the, the rest of the country, they pulled back to, a, I mean, literally in a day, they just turned everything around. We can't do that here. I, I wish we were able to, but you know, hopefully, as I said, you know, if if we can have good conversations with um, you know business sectors and other sectors, we might be able to do something locally. You know, um, but still, I mean, you can imagine the amount of um, resistance we would get if we were to go backwards. I mean, I was seriously at that time saying, you know, we we were at phase two and things were out of control, and there was no end to it. That we seriously should have been thinking about going to a 1.5, you know, um, which if you remember, that's what King County did. We went to phase, from phase one to phase two, King County had to go to a 1.5 where like restaurants could only do outdoor seating, you know, so on and so forth. But, you know, it would have been nice if we had an option to do something like that. So we, you know, instead of waiting till, you know, a few months later and we hit our peak and we turn around, right? So. Uh, I, again, it's not a threat. It's not to scare people. It's just that we don't, you know, we don't have a vaccine and we don't have any magical cure for this thing. And, and we've got to just use these very general public health tools, which, which work, by the way. We have seen it work, right? And we've seen the cases turn around, come down. Um, but, you know, we, you know we, we just need to keep working at it. And hopefully if we ha can develop more finer tuned instruments, then that'll be helpful. By the way, what you were saying about your 18 year old reminded me, uh, I'm gonna have an ask for you guys. I know you're already doing a lot. And as Amber said, you guys are doing great in your practices. Uh, but the one thing I'm gonna ask you all to do, uh, and I'm glad you're putting this mask up, because, uh, this sign up about the masking, but you know, your 18 year old might not listen to you, but they might listen to someone else that they respect or they follow, you know, whatever. Um, I really need you all to mobilize your social networks and get the word out, okay? Um, by the way, I was really impressed. I was on a call um, with, I think it was the Sumner Bonnie Lake Chamber, and one of the business owners told me, she sits down with all her employees and not only does she go over all the rules, right? Hey, are you doing the cleaning? Are you wearing the mask? And so on and so forth. She also talks to them about what they do when they go home. And she reminds them when they go home, they shouldn't be going out, hanging out with their friends. They shouldn't be going out to big, you know, gatherings. They shouldn't be driving all over the place. Okay. And, and that's what we need is everyone needs to get on board. And we all have to take these um, steps we have to tell everyone we know we need to mobilize our social networks uh, because there there's some networks you all have that we don't have um, and we just need everyone doing this so we can drive the numbers down dr chen thank you so much for your time today i look forward to taking up on your offer and working together to figure out how we can uh, bring the virus down and save so many of our great restaurants and hotels um, in pierce county uh, the 10,000 jobs that are still gone, uh, hopefully start bringing some of those back um, and, and, and working together to drive the virus down and open our businesses and, and, and save a lot of people's dreams and, and keep people safe. So we're in this together. And, and I think your theme, uh, I appreciate the offer. So Amber, anything you were hoping to get out there for our industry to work on before uh, we sign off? No, I think it's all been well covered and I just appreciate the work that you guys have done to also get the word out. So it's not just us. All right. Well, any operators have follow-up questions that didn't get to ask, uh, feel free to follow up with us and uh, uh, we will get the answers out to you. Uh, again, Amber and Dr. Chen, thank you so much for joining us. Joe and Sam, thanks for the updates. Everybody have a great month and Hopefully when we're on again next month with Dr. Dan Meyer, I mean, uh, Bruce Dan Meyer, um, we'll show another big drop in, in cases. Please fill out this survey um, and tell us